Good morning. Welcome to the 2015-16 season of Prime Time, and that's heartfelt. Uh, Prime Time at the Bethel Library is a celebration of the experiences and accomplishments of Bethel faculty, students, and staff, and is a collaborative project between the Friends of the Bethel Library, faculty development, and other offices at campus. Most presentations are recorded and can be found in the BU Digital Library. Be sure to check the library's news and events webpage and the calendar for what's coming up on the schedule. Join us on Tuesday, October 6, as we welcome Dr. Ruth Nelson, Associate Professor of Psychology, Dr. Jeff Jacob, Associate Professor of Economics, and Sam Mulberry, Assistant Professor of History, as they present what they've learned from analyzing 10 years of academic enrichment and support center data. Today we welcome Dr. Scott Winner, Assistant Professor of Journalism, and celebrate his newly published book, Nebraska Ball, Coach Tim Miles and the Big Ten Team on the Rise. <clears throat> and a formal remarks. Um, I wore Nebraska red today. I didn't even know that. I guess it's not exactly the way it should, but <laughs> it'll have to do. Um, when Scott came to Bethel a year ago, and with him he brought, I still remember him talking about this and saying this, um, an old laptop that he literally had worn out from a couple years worth of reporting and research on University of Nebraska Lincoln basketball coach Tim Miles. Throughout the last year, in addition to getting into the Bethel Groove, which is no easy task when you come from the University of Nebraska Lincoln, um, teaching journalism classes and instituting some awesome changes into the Clarion culture and product, which you can see later today, some of which for this year. Scott turned those research notes into a compelling biography, Nebraska Ball, that was released by the University of Nebraska Press this fall. And I believe you can buy copies of the book here today. Um, um, I have my copy here, already well worn. Um, I'm confident that you're going to find it such a compelling and crisply written saga that even a non-sports geek like myself um, has been intrigued enough to keep turning pages. Um, it's a, a great um, read about something that I know very little about, but it's written in such a way that I'm learning as I go. The English department is really thrilled to have Scott on our team, um, so please join me in welcoming him to the first primetime uh, program. start by doing what Tim Miles would do after the first time out. I'm going to take my jacket off <laughs> and just throw it um, before he comes out at 3.47, 3 minutes and 47 seconds before game time. It's exactly when he walks out because that was his best time in some track event. Um, and the first time he left at that time, he won a game, so he's been coming out uh, at exactly that time ever since. But right before he does that, he also removes a certain piece of clothing. And I will not tell you whether or not I did that in my office before coming down <laughs> here today. That's something you don't want to know. I'd rather start with my favorite topic, which is myself. <laughs> um, so first of all, thank you to everybody, the primetime people, the library people, to Genevieve for helping me out up front, to uh, my colleagues who thought it would be pretty funny not only to make me do this, but also to maybe make me read this book, as was suggested by one colleague, but okay, content marketing rather than reading my book, which <laughs> would have been pretty funny if I could have pulled it off with a straight face, but I don't think I could have. Um, you guys, I'm from North Dakota. Thanks, thanks a lot. <laughs> um, um, North Dakota was a great place to stay focused. <laughs> Not a lot of distractions. Um, and when I was growing up, I had three chores uh, my dad would make me do. Uh, my mom was a workaholic banker. She didn't make me do anything, which is great. Um, but my dad said, you know, clean out the dishwasher when the dishes are clean, which I didn't do. And he said, um, clean your room, at least get the clothes off the floor, which I didn't do. And he was a sports editor in town, and he said, go cover that hockey game, which I did do because I got paid minimum wage, uh, $3.15 an hour. And I'll tell you how, much, how old I am. So I did that, 
and I parlayed that into a job uh, during my college years at the University of North Dakota. Thank you very much. Um, where um, I just did sports writing for the Fargo Forum and then the Grand Forks Herald, uh, basically in an era when you could pay for your college by working. So I worked 30, 35 hours, sometimes 60 hours to do that. And my, my days were, were pretty interesting, I think, uh, even though I was living in North Dakota. Um, during the day, I would take Shakespeare classes and romantic poetry classes and a lot of American self fiction classes. For some reason, we had a lot of great American self professors up there. And I learned a lot about storytelling. Then at night, I'd have to go cover a hockey game. Okay, So at 3 o'clock, I would go to the paper. I'd make some calls to coaches. I'd decide which game I'm covering that night. And I would get in my Dotson 4x4 pickup, drive to Hardee's, get three hot ham and cheeses, and a Dr. Pepper, and charge it to the paper. Hit the road and drive to Roseau, Minnesota, where I could cover Section 8 hockey, the best hockey in the, in the world played by teenagers at the time. And I would go there, and I would set up shop in the penalty box, which is the closest place I could get to the ice. And I would get another hot dog, maybe two hot dogs, a couple of Cokes, charge it to the paper. And my job from 7 o'clock to 9 o'clock at that high school hockey game was to just look for moments and look for characters who compelled me. And I did it so many times. I mean, in those four years, between volleyball uh, matches at Mayville State, hockey games up in Roseau, uh, North Dakota State University basketball and, and, and Bison football, I mean, I covered a lot of games. And I'd seen my dad cover a lot of games in his 40-year career. And essentially, the same thing happens every time you cover a game. Two teams come out, one team wins, one team loses. So when the game's over, I got to produce a story in 45 minutes and send to the paper on some of the original laptops ever made, which you had to plug a phone into a coupler and send it over, and it was awful. And I did that from Zamboni rooms across Minnesota and North Dakota. And my job after that game was over was to go to the winning locker room and talk to a player and a coach, go to the losing locker room, talk to a coach and a player, figure out who my main character was. Who were the protagonists? Who were the antagonists? I took all my English knowledge and pumped them into those stories because I would get bored if I had to write the same story over and over again and if readers had to read that same story over and over again. And it was great training for wanting to write stories and wanting to write books, wanting to write stories that mattered because, folks, the biggest advantage I had was I didn't care. I didn't care who won. I didn't care about hockey. I didn't care about basketball. I cared about the story. And that was great training ground for me. Because as an athlete, I was pretty bitter. <laughs> I was a failed basketball player, a failed hockey player. I was pretty good at track, actually. But I hated track because I threw up before every race because I was so nervous. You're looking at a man who is mentally weak, folks. <laughs> but I wanted to be a writer. And sports writing really helped me with that. And eventually, it led to my first book. Um, after college, I got distracted by meeting a beautiful woman and marrying her and then making beautiful kids. Uh, I, I, and I blamed them for that. I mean, they distracted me from writing books and they were, you know, my ruin. And that was my excuse. Um, I taught and did journalism in southern Minnesota, in Colorado. I'm the only person to ever move his family to North Dakota three times, <laughs> going back and forth. And eventually landed in Nebraska where I got my, my master's and um, Eventually, this book happened. While all that was happening, there was a guy who grew up in a small town called Dolan, South Dakota. And he went to the University of Mary at Bismarck and became a failed basketball player there. And eventually, so bad that the coach asked him, look, can you just coach the JV team and stay out of my hair? And my wife met this guy and was not impressed by him because she went to the same college he went to at the University of Mary in Bismarck. Well, he eventually became an assistant basketball coach at Northern State and grad assistant. He became the head coach at Mayville State, a place you've never heard of, and turned a losing program into a winning one. Then he did the same thing in Marshall, Minnesota, at Southwest Minnesota State. Then he did the same thing at North Dakota State. Then he did the same thing at Colorado State. And he wound up coaching everywhere I had taught or been a journalist. And eight years after I'd been in Nebraska, he showed up um, as the new coach that nobody had heard of. And my wife said, I know that guy. He's a dork. <laughs> and I got coffee with him, and I said, you know what? I think you're pretty interesting, and I think there's a story here. 
And a colleague of mine in Nebraska said, you gotta have two things to write a book. One is you gotta believe in the story. And I couldn't believe how a kid from the Dakotas, a town of 300, could become a millionaire coach on the national level. And I wanted to know why, and I believed in that story. And the second thing you had to have is you had to think that you're the person to write it. Well, folks, you had been all the same places I had been. I knew the terrain, and I knew I would outwork everybody on this story. So I'm going to read a couple things to you, and then try to open it up for questions. Not that I think you'll have any questions about Nebraska basketball. And I'll try to make this quick so you can go on with your lives. And my big thing about sports writing is I, most of it bores me. I think um, most people write about what happens in the game. Well, if I cared about what happened in the game, I would have watched the game. And if I didn't care what, happened, what the score was, I'm not going to read about it in your paper or your magazine. You know what I mean? So my goal here was to take readers places they couldn't go. So we're going to start with practice. At tonight's late September opening scrimmage at Pinnacle Bank Arena, Tim Miles will take the microphone to get 7,500 fans riled up. For many of them, this will be their first experience at the Pinnacle Bank Arena, part of the biggest public work, works project in Lincoln's history. Their tax dollars will pay for the $378 million project. They need a good time. That means Miles will have to show his big grin. Tim Miles will have to lead chance. He'll have to call some play-by-play -play over the public address system. He'll have to talk up his team, talk up his product. And he can play that role. He's made fans care about perennial losing programs at Mayville State in North Dakota and Southwest Minnesota State in Marshall. He's handed out free tickets to students in dorms at North Dakota State. He's hosted his own reality TV show for Mountain West Conference fans while at Colorado State. He can play Miles the Marketer. But those players are going to pay dearly for tonight's praise in advance with this last practice, three hours before the doors open to the arena. The currency will be defense. Miles the marker, Marketer can also play Miles the Tyrant. Miles often says being around his team is like being on an episode of Seinfeld. But many practice, including this one, are more breaking bad than situation comedy. <laughs> Assistant coaches stand at center court in their futuristic Adidas sweat suits. By the way, everything Adidas makes looks like it's made for people in the future. You know, <laughs> Star Trek, you know. Um, arms folded, eyes darting from player to player, stretching methodically to strength coach Tim Wilson's set routine. Wilson used to work in the NBA, so players followed his routine without question. Hip-hop music breaks in the new sound system to keep things loose, and Wilson lines up the team to start warm-up drills from baseline to baseline. When head coach finally appears, he's always late. With his handwritten and photocopied practice outline from the coach's locker room, the music devolves into rapid-fire F-bombs. Miles makes a beeline for the scorer's table and tells student manager Skylar Sullivan to cut the sound. If you're, gonna give me a, if you're not going to give me a better playlist, we're not going to play music, Miles says to the team. I don't give a shit. If swearing is going to be done in the arena this afternoon, he's going to be the one doing it. <laughs> Players, especially first-year guys, don't know if this anger is genuine or for effect. Sometimes the assistant coaches don't know either, though they have their suspicions. If Miles wants to direct their excitement about tonight's public scrimmage and halftime dunk contest into an efficient and strenuous practice, the lyrics were just a convenient excuse to get their attention. And the punishment starts right away. Miles calls for the Iba drill, named after legendary coach Henry Iba from Oklahoma State. He's the coach who most American basketball historians say had the 1972 Olympic gold medal stolen from him, his team, and the country by referees in Munich, Germany. He's also the father of Moa Iba, the first Nebraska coach to take the perennial losing Husker program to the NCAA tournament where the Huskers lost to Western Kentucky in the first round in 1986 and hasn't ever won a game. Moa Iba was also Dan, Don Haskins' assistant and main recruiter at Texas Western, now UTEP, when the unknown school shocked Adolph Rupp's Kentucky team in the NCAA title game in 1966. That game was college basketball's Jackie Robinson moment. Unless these Husker players can connect the dots from watching the movie version of the story in Glory Road, they have limited knowledge of such history. And their freshman starting point guard, Ty Webster from New Zealand, he can't even name three quarters of the teams in the Big Ten. <laughs> but they all know Nebraska has never won an NCAA tournament game, which Miles promised the Husker fans when he took the job. All that starts with GATA drills. GATA, G-A-T-A, is a Miles acronym for Get After Their Asses. <laughs> By the way, I checked the movies back there, and they have every Woody Allen movie in there, so I thought I could say those words. <laughs> and among those drills is the IBA drill, which goes something like this. 
A player gets one over and takes the charge. Then a ball is rolled up to midcourt where that player must dive for it and hurl it back to an assistant coach all in one motion. Then he must get up quickly and sprint back to take a return pass from the coach and try to score a fast break layup. But waiting at the rim is that Skylar Sullivan, the six foot four, 200 pound lead student manager, a junior at University of Nebraska. Coaches and players call him Woody because he's a doppelganger for Disney's Toy Story Cowboy. <laughs> Facial expressions and all. Some players don't even know his real name. Woody holds a Husker red blocking pad that looks like it belongs on the football practice field and uses it to both protect himself from the force of incoming scorers, but also to deliver blows once players are mid-air. This is the Big Ten boys, Miles often calls out. You gotta take the contact, now hit him, Woody. Woody is the hardest part of the IBA drill. He scored 13 points per game as a high school senior in Grand Island, about 100 miles west on I-80, but he's not good enough to play here. So he submits to any abuse Miles might send his way in his dream of becoming a college coach himself. Some players can't, can't score on Woody and his padded weapon. They must track down their misses and try again and again, hide their pain from the body blows, more tired with each attempt. Freshman Nick Fuller, a three-point shooter from Wisconsin, takes nine shots to score, slowing down each time he rebounds his own miss to prepare to drive hard to the hole again. And after the eighth miss, Miles, in the sweetest voice he can devise, asks, do you want to pass the ball back out to Coach Harriman? <laughs> the question actually means this, do you want to show your teammates who you really are and quit? <laughs> Maybe go home to Sun Prairie and the land of cheese and admit you can't make it on this level? <laughs> Passing the ball to Coach without scoring is an admission of defeat. Instead, Fuller blasts through Woody's swinging pad to score with his offhand. Point guard Benny Parker, nearly a foot shorter than Woody, takes four shots to score. David Rivers struggles with his first two blasts, but knocks Woody backward on the third try and scores. Division I redshirt sophomore transfers Tram Padaway and Walt Pitchford score easily on their first tries. They're full of nervous energy because tonight's open scrimmage, where they'll finally get to dunk in front of Husker fans after more than a year of waiting, is coming. Near the end of the drill, forward and Captain Siobhan Shields, the son of Husker All-American offensive lineman Will Shields. Football is the only thing that matters in Nebraska. An NFL Hall of Famer gathers and plants his shoulder into Woody in his football pad, knocking the student manager onto his tailbone where he bounces his head out of bounds beneath the hoop. This spot on the new arena floor will be the setting for tonight's defining moment of the scrimmage. For now, the moment belongs to Woody who is dazed on his back under his blocking pad with Shields standing over him, offering him a hand up. You gotta be tough, Woody, Miles yells, before realizing his manager might actually be hurt. His question isn't as, as syrupy as the one he asked Fuller a few minutes ago, but it's syrupy. You okay? Woody shakes his head as if to fight off an oncoming concussion, and Miles moves forward to grab the pad from him and take the next few shots with the pad himself which gets freshman Nate Hawkins pretty excited. He's last up in the Iowa drill. He'd love a shot at his coach. He's been yelling at him for a week. But Woody shakes his head again at the coach and gathers himself in front of the hoop, waiting for Hawkins, his eyes glassy. Miles slaps the student manager on the butt. Let's hear it for Woody, he yells. And the team starts screaming Woody's name and clapping. They're screaming for Woody, not Nate Hawkins. The assistant coaches grin and yelled even louder. The assistant coach, Chris Harriman from Australia, in particular, is a physicality junkie, eyes lighting up and teeth bared, like Jack Nicholson's as he peeks through an axe broken door in The Shining. <laughs> then everyone starts yelling for Hawkins, too, as he dives for his ball past midcourt and throws it back to Harriman while sliding backward. Hawkins picks himself up and sprints to get a return pass. He plants two feet in the lane to gather himself for what he's hit. He misses and has to retrieve the ball and try again and again before he gets it in. Cheers for both of them. Miles loves the punishment of the Ivy drill, so he made his 1999 Southwest Minnesota State team perform it in warm-ups in front of the crowd before games. Just, so, just because I was pissed at him, he said. On the road, the effect was hushed off from opposing fans, but at home, the gym exploded from his fan base. For these Huskers, there's no rest after the Ivy drill, no water, and the next drill, it hurts even more. So that's practice. But my favorite character was Tim Miles' mama. And Al Miles is the reason Tim Miles said no to me right away uh, when I asked him to do this book, because he said, I don't want my mom to know I swear. And I said, Tim, she knows you swear. He goes, yeah, but she doesn't know how much, and she doesn't know which words I use. <laughs>
Al smiles, looks down, and shakes her head. She hates to admit it, but there's no two ways about it. She spoiled her son, and she had her reasons, and she still regrets them all. Tim Miles was the youngest of her five kids, and as they grew up, she had more time to spend on him. Plus, he was the only grandkid among 30 who had those smiling brown eyes. But the real reason was bigger. In 1968, when Tim was a year old, Alice had trouble conceiving a sixth child. She'd had three girls and then two boys within 11 years. Um, she and husband Tip wanted another boy, and a doctor told her she had cancer in the uterus and ovaries. Tip drove her 50 miles east on Highway 212 to Watertown for a hysterectomy. She made a full recovery, but the health emergency changed how she treated her littlest boy. The grandparents were taken with him, too. And apparently everyone in little Dolan, South Dakota, Dolan, by the way, on one side of Dolan, the sign says 307 people. And on the other side of Dolan, it says 298 people. So Miles says he's always looking for the other nine. <laughs> um, everyone in Dolan except his older sister, who claimed she, Karen, who claimed she raised him, had to deal with him 24 hours a day while mom ran the weekly newspaper they owned. And dad worked in Redfield at a state school for the developmentally disabled. Norbert Tip Miles served in World War II, but showed up to the Pacific Theater too late to see any real action. He enlisted November 6, 1944, and the Army deployed him to the Philippines as Harry Truman sent a B-29 bomber to Hiroshima. Weeks later, his company hopped on a Navy tank landing ship in a typhoon of 40 and 50 foot waves on the way to Japan. And down on the tank deck, the Navy sailors asked each other, in front of the nauseous and panic-stricken new infantrymen, do you guys think the ship will survive another storm like this? When her boys returned from World War II, Tip's mother started saying rosaries for him. And eventually she would say rosaries for her one brown-eyed grandson, who would call her to pray for wins before rivalry games. I'm going to skip ahead. Tip Miles is the kind of guy who will spend 20 minutes telling you his wife does all the talking. <laughs> Growing up with talkers like Tick Banalis helps a child own any interview, press conference, or speaking engagement and win over ESPN writers and play-by-play -play announcers from across the country. Tim Miles' parents say the youngest son was a talker from the start. And yes, spoiled too. He sucked the pacifier until just before he entered kindergarten. And mom didn't have the heart to take it away. In fact, as he played on the sidewalk outside the family newspaper that he'd later dominate with 144 point headlines in high school and college, Alice kept extra pacifiers ready in the mailbox slots in the newspaper in the newsroom for when he dropped his in the gutter. One summer day, though, an older woman visiting the Miles home on unmarked Main Street told Tim he couldn't bring that pacifier to start school in the fall. The kids would make fun of him. Tim kept sucking and spinning around the living room. He was definitely ADHD, Alice says. No doubt, crying. Then the old woman cut the boy a deal. Not his mother, but the other woman. And Tim Miles liked deals. He's always liked deals. I tell you what, she said. I'll give you a brand new dollar bill for that pacifier. Tim stopped playing and sat with perfect posture in a living room chair, staring at the old woman. When she got up to leave, she pulled out a crisp dollar and handed it to Tim. And Tim handed over the pacifier. That night, oldest sister Karen was babysitting Tim. And mom told her where the extra pacifiers were if Tim started struggling. But he went to bed without complaint. The woman gave Tim a dollar every year on his birthday after that, and $18 when he graduated, which still makes Alice shake her head and cluck her tongue. Everybody cluck your tongue. Exactly. When she thinks about it. Money mattered to Tim, Tip and Alice figure, because they didn't have any. You know, Alice says, you didn't have credit cards back then. What you had to do, you had to do with what you had. And if you didn't have it, you couldn't spend it. You just had to make do. So what I did was I made make do, making do, the theme of the first section of the book, because that's what Tim has to do at Nebraska, where he has no talent. I don't want to take you to Dolan one more time. When Tim Miles grew up, his family went to the post office every day, but except Sunday to get the mail, because they really had no real address. They lived on what residents <coughs> called Main Street, but Dolan had no street signs back then. Later, Maine was named Humphrey Avenue because Hubert Humphrey spent much of his childhood there and graduated from Dolan High. His dad was the town pharmacist and served as mayor. Humphrey would be a major player in the Democratic Party in Minnesota, where he united the party um, with the Farmer Labor Party to create the DFL. And on the national level, he served as a US Senator, as Lyndon Johnson's Vice President, and as a Democratic nominee for President in 1968, where he lost to Richard Nixon. 
Not bad for Dolan. Miles regularly slips into motivational talks or regular conversation that Dolan High School produced four military generals and Humphrey. But his mother thinks the Dolan heroes who most influenced her son were the Kozlowski brothers. The Kozlowski twins lost their mother to brain cancer at age two, and later in adulthood, Dennis Kozlowski would admit that his father never really recovered, dealing with the loss by drinking and shipping the kids off to live with relatives. They went off to a farm, attacked their chores, started wrestling, rammed heads together, and turned themselves into Greco-Roman wrestlers at the 1988 Seoul Olympics, where Dennis medaled and Dwayne finished eighth. Dennis then returned at 32 years old to compete in the 92 Barcelona Olympic Games, where the glory of a silver medal, only the second time an American had medaled at two Olympics in Greco-Roman wrestling, was headlocked by the noise of Michael Jordan, Charles Barkley, Magic Johnson, and the rest of their dream team. When the Kozlowski brothers were in high school, Tim Miles was a loudmouthed, frozen pizza-eating basketball gym rat, annoying his sixth grade teachers on the other end of the Dolan High School. One day in class, Dennis Kozlowski jerked Miles out of class and taught him the fireman's carry. His teacher must not have minded because he pulled him out of class every day for two weeks until M Miles mastered the move. Miles tells the story on the radio at Carlos O'Kelly's Mexican restaurant um, to continue his strategy of not talking about the Creighton game. He just lost horribly. He says, so I basically ran through districts and regionals as a one-trick pony with the fireman's carry. In those days, Alice would wake up early to breakfast, and the beat-up car that the Kozlowski twins brought to school would be parked across the street at 6 a.m., and the boys would be inside working out. When her kids showed up in the kitchen, Alice would point out the window at that disaster of a car and tell her kids that those boys have nothing, but they're going to outwork everybody else. They have the discipline. They're not afraid of hard work. They're not afraid of pain. Dennis Kozlowski's twin brother, Dwayne, said in an Aberdeen American News Where Are They Now story that athletics taught me, me anything is possible with discipline, dedication, and a plan. The Kozlowski twins went on to tiny University of Minnesota Morris. They kept working hard, going to school, playing football, and wrestling, then doing damage on the national and international wrestling scenes. Dennis then became a high-profile chiropractor in Minneapolis, working with the Minnesota Vikings, Twins, and Timberwolves. Dwayne became a financial planner in Virginia. But Alice tells her kids, especially Tim, but she thinks that the Kozlowskis were the inspiration, a symbol of possibility, and she made sure of it. I'd say, look at this car out here. They're going to be somebody, Alice says now. Tim took that to heart. I can do anything coming from Dolan. Being from Dolan, you just made do with what you had. Those brothers okay, overcame tough circumstances was her point. So go out there and be somebody. So Tim Miles turned around programs at four levels of college basketball before he made it to the Big Ten. When he came to the Big Ten, he came to Nebraska, which is probably the worst school to join the Big Ten. Never won an NCAA tournament game. Only been there six times. Hadn't been there since 1998. And he promised people in his press conference that they were going to win an NCAA tournament game. He figured it would take four years. So he begged me not to do this book until year three or possibly year four. I told him, no, it's got to be year two. I need it now. This is for me. <laughs> this is my story, not your story. He said, no, we can't do it. My mom won't like the swearing, and we're going to be losing. It's going to be horrible. And the team started out 0-4 in the Big Ten, and 8-8 eight and eight overall. But then they started winning. And I didn't have a lot of money to do this book. I could only afford to go on the road with them to two places in the Big Ten. So which two would you pick? If you could go anywhere, where would you go? Michigan State and Indiana. And that's where the two most magical things happen during the season. And weirdly enough, when I was in the locker room, because I left the country for four weeks to teach a class in the Dominican Republic, and the Huskers were just getting pounded that month in January. But at one point in the season, the Huskers were 17 and 8. But with me in the locker room, they were 15 and 0. Hmm. So I would like to parlay that into a job somewhere. <laughs> Um, so they started making me come to games. <coughs> so my students suffered, but they're just students, so it's okay. So I want to skip to the epilogue, because the story arc of that season was pretty amazing. And the book goes back and forth. John Steinbeck is who I always wanted to be, and I wanted to be him by age 25, and I'm still not him for some reason. But I want to pattern it after Graves of Wrath, go back and forth, chapter 
the chapter, the jokes, the depression back and forth, the season, his history back and forth. But the season got too interesting. Um, and it culminated in two technical fouls that were pretty amazing. And me hanging out with the coach in the locker room while his team was out there trying to make history. And he couldn't find a TV to watch the game. It was pretty dramatic. So I just want to skip to the epilogue and read four more paragraphs to you. Kevin Miles says his little brother will always be the littlest dog in the fight, no matter how big he gets or thinks he is. When they were kids in Dolan, he would beat on Tim when Tim was too annoying, too loud, too cocky. Non-stop with that Nerf hoop on the door. Hmm. Kevin would hold Tim down until Tim said, Uncle. Then the boy would come right back for more with everything he had, claiming he had his fingers crossed when he admitted defeat. <laughs> Alice would finally call her own timeout, just like her son would later, before heading back to the table to get the newspaper out. And Tim would be sentenced to the blue chair in the living room, seething. And Kevin, facing him from the hallway bench 15 feet away, would mouth these words. <laughs> and Tim Miles would just grin back. That's who he is. <laughs> Folks, this is not a self-help book. This is not really a basketball book. It's just a book about some characters who I thought were interesting at a time that mattered in their lives. And I'm proud of it because it was hard. It was really hard. And it's really done, which feels really good. Um, so I think we have like two to five minutes for a couple questions if anybody wants to ask any. I don't know how many questions you have about this, but feel free. And you think about how embarrassing it would be for me if nobody asked a question. <laughs> so, yeah. how many years did you um, So it was the summer of 2013 when I asked him, can we do the book? And then I did my research for three months, and then pour in in the season, started in October about this time. Followed him all the way throughout the year. Uh, did a lot of interviewing post-season. Uh, but my deadline for the book was November of last year. So I started teaching at Bethel uh, in, in August or September. But I had a book deadline in November. So it was a crazy, crazy time. But about 18 months total. It's like having two full-time jobs. Yeah. Uh, what are your thoughts on your next one? Next one, I have two ideas in mind um, that are not sports related, and I have one idea in mind that's sports related. So if anybody has Jerry Kill's number <laughs> at University of Minnesota, let me know. But I, I'm, I'm kind of weighing my options, but I don't know. I'm going to be secretive, mysterious. Is that okay? I think one more creative nonfiction uh, would make sense, um, something really journalistic, literary journalism. And then I think I'll move toward fiction after that, if anybody cares what I have to say. <laughs> what did you learn about yourself through the process? Um, I think you never know if you can really do it, right? You always dream that you can do it. And to be honest, when I was a sports writer early in my career, I lost a love for sports. Like, the higher up the ladder I went in sports, getting into Minnesota Vikings locker rooms, big time college football locker rooms. I came to really dislike sports. Uh, the money involved, the egos involved, the machismo involved. I mean, I'm a pretty macho guy, but these guys. Um, and I lost a love for sport. And, and doing this book reminded me what it was like to be in the Metrodome in 1987 or 91. The fact that, you know, aside from Taylor Swift, very few things on this planet can make 50,000 people lose their minds. And so there must be something substantive there. And, and you know, I don't know, I, I kind of really into love sports game, and I knew that I could do it. You never really know until you do it, right? So I wasn't just talking, finally. Good question. Anything else? Yeah? Who's going to play Tim in the movie? Tim in the movie? Um, he thinks Matt Damon. <laughs> um, I think he's ridiculous. Um, <laughs> by the way, I lost the cover battle and I lost the name battle. Yeah. Um, Nebraska ball is really a cute word, isn't it? Um, I wanted tougherness because at Michigan State, Tim Miles was writing on the board in front of his team at a time when he said, we have to plant our feet and we have to make a move right now. And he's writing on the board and he says the keys in this loud Breslin Center. And I want to beat Tim Tom is a, uh, because he's a great coach. And the key to, to winning this lot arena is we got to be together and we got to be tough. And so he's trying to write 
togetherness on the board, and he's saying toughness, so he writes tougherness. <laughs> and that's the title I want. Yeah. Tougherness, right? Because Jay Billis from ESPN had written a book called Toughness, and I thought my book would be a little bit better than this. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Any others? Yeah. So what does a sports program, a Division three sports program like, like that does have that's valuable that a Big Ten program uh, It has stuff that's valuable that a Big Ten program doesn't have. I mean, the practice facilities in Nebraska may have seven foot deep leather couches and may have iPads in lockers that can be programmed to play music in the shower across the hall, the stainless steel shower, and a whole two walls of screens that are playing Big Ten Network and ESPN. It might have all those things, right? When you walk in, basketballs light up through the hallway as you move with them. They have sensors on them. It's creepy, right? <laughs> Bethel may not have that stuff, but you know what Bethel does have? I can go sit in the second row and laugh at Jared Nelson when he misses a three, right? <laughs> but I think, better yet, it's a more pure sport. Okay. These guys aren't trying to become professionals. These guys aren't just trying to impress women. They're playing, well, they probably are, but they're, they're playing because they love the sport, right? And I think the coaches are coaching for the right reasons, and the athletes are playing for the right reasons, and that's what Bethel has that I would argue Nebraska doesn't always have, uh, which is why togetherness was such a big um, part of this. You know, it sounds corny, right? But it was such a big part of this book because he had to kick off one of his best players and the only player from Nebraska. And the key to him succeeding, the coach, was having this Nebraska kid succeed, and he had to kick him off. And uh, because some people are doing it for the wrong reasons, and that's a really dramatic part of the book. And what I love about this book is that it puts the reader there when that happened. When the coach tells the team, look, Deverell's gone. You're there. And you don't usually get into it looks at programs like that. That kind of access never happens, you know? So, yeah. How would you define the community around basketball? The community? Um, they're in the top 10 in attendance. And they have an arena that's pretty amazing. Um, and at, you know, at three points in the season, people started questioning whether this was a football state anymore. right? So community is pretty crazy. And during that season, they went from having 50 people show up for the radio show to having to turn away hundreds. Um, so it's it's pretty incredible. I never became best friends with anybody. You know, I tried to be a fly on the wall so that I would disappear into the woodwork until they figured out that I was 15 and 0 in the locker room and then I came out of the woodwork. But um, in the end, I would say there are coaches on that team that I think I could hang out with now that the story's over. Um, and I think they're good guys. And I think before doing this book, I would have said there are no coaches who are good guys the way people say there are no politicians who are good people. You know what I mean? So. It's pretty solid. It's a good crew. All right, thanks you guys for coming. This is ridiculous.